Today's scripture reading is Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. When the feast of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Without warning, there was a sound like a strong wind, gale force. No one could tell where it came from. It filled the whole building. Then, like a wildfire, the Holy Spirit spread through their ranks, and they started speaking in a number of different languages as the Spirit prompted them. There were many Jews staying in Jerusalem just then, devout pilgrims from all over the world. When they heard the sound, they came on the run. Then when they heard, one after another, their own mother tongues being spoken, they were thunderstruck. They couldn't for the life of them figure out what was going on, and kept saying, Aren't these all Galileans? How come we're hearing them talk in our various mother tongues? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, visitors from Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, immigrants from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, even Cretans and Arabs. They're speaking our languages, describing God's mighty works. Their heads were spinning. They couldn't make head or tail of any of it. They talked back and forth, confused. What's going on here? Others joked, they're drunk on cheap wine. <laughs> That's when Peter stood up and backed by the other eleven, spoke out with bold urgency. Fellow Jews, all of you who are visiting Jerusalem, listen carefully and get this story straight. These people aren't drunk, as some of you suspect. They haven't had time to get drunk. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. (laughs) This is what the prophet Joel announced would happen. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on every kind of people. Your sons will prophesy, also your daughters. Your young men will see visions, your old men dream dreams. When the time comes, I'll pour out my spirit on those who serve me, men and women both, and they'll prophesy. I'll set wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billowing smoke, the sun turning black and the moon blood red before the day of the Lord arrives, the day tremendous and marvelous, and whoever calls out for help, to me, God, will be saved. Today, but I forgot, so maybe next year. <laughs> I should tell you the story behind the Something Beautiful song that we sang when I was um, serving in Central City at St. James United Church. There was a choir director who could make you do anything that you did not want to do. I, she was, I don't know how she did that, but um, she would just pull you up there and within a matter of two to three minutes, you would be um, playing the ukulele or the guitar or the trombone, like any, any instrument that you've never touched before, you would be doing something in worship with it, like within five minutes. It was horrifying and frightening. And the last, so something beautiful was one of the ones you did, because I guess the chords must be easy to do, for, I don't know. But I played that on the ukulele, I played it on guitar. I can't do it now, somehow I could do it with her. And the last Sunday that I was serving there, Todd came to church with us, and this would never happen again in the history of our lives. She somehow got Todd and Jake and I to do a trio. <laughs> I can't do that, but somehow I did it. So every time we hear that song, we think of Susan and St. James. In the, the story that you heard today, the thing that I like about the pen, there's many things that you can talk about with this Pentecost story. Everybody's speaking in the same language on place. It's kind of about global unity. There's things about realizing that you all have the same passion for the same God. There's many things you can talk about. But one of the things that kind of happens a little further on, and actually more in John, the Gospel of John, is Jesus, I think there's something wrong with that. Jesus is telling the disciples he's going to go away and that they don't have to have him there to continue their work. That he actually says in one part of the Gospel of John, it's actually better if I go away so that the Spirit can come. If I stay, Jesus says, you'll just focus on me. He will the flesh, me doing what you, I want you to do, following me around. <clears throat> but if you have to figure out how to embody this faith without me around, then your focus will be different. So you focus on ways to have Christ as a part of who you are, embodying the essence of Christ. That's what Jesus means when he goes away and the Spirit comes. 
And when I was reading this earlier this week, it, it kind of reminds me of a long distance relationship. You know, when you're in love with someone and living apart, your relationship's not about time spent together. At least it wasn't in the old days. I guess kind of has changed that a little bit. It's not about holding hands or kissing one another or gazing in each other's eyes, because it can be. You're apart from the one you love. And yet it's sometimes those long-distance relationships that are able to grow and develop into strong and lasting loves. Not because of time spent together, but because of love shared across the miles. You share things in different ways when you're not side by side every single day. Your loved one walks with you through life, living in your heart and soul, even though you're not physically in the same place. That's kind of what's being described in this Pentecost story. Jesus is now with the disciples in spirit. And the spirit enters into their lives in this rush of a violent wind, or like fiery tongues of flame burning over their heads. But I think it might be important to think just for a minute that this is not, as is sometimes confused, the beginning of the spirit in the world in this moment. That would be kind of a Christocentric view of things. Because the spirit has always been, the spirit has been with us from the beginning. The spirit is described in many ways throughout the Bible, even before we get to these images we hear in this Pentecost story of wind and flame. In the creation story, the spirit is breath, breathing life into man. In the Exodus, the spirit is described as a cloud, leading the people into Exodus. In the baptism of Jesus by John, the spirit comes as dove. And now in this particular story, the spirit is described as fire and wind. So you have breath and cloud, and dove and fire and wind. You can probably think of other images that you relate to that might describe the spirit for you. This story of the Pentecost reminds us that we always have had the spirit with us then, but we just had to have a moment when we recognized it. And that it may actually come to reside with us in moments that we don't expect. Because in that upper room that they were gathered in, they were hiding. They were living in fear for their lives in the days after Jesus uh, crucifixion, crucifixion. So they weren't in a place of expecting a spirit to come and unity to happen. Brian McLaren tells us that becoming a people who are willing to be alive in the spirit means that we are willing then to share in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. In this three-part process, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, that we're willing to share by getting the spirit we have to first let go. That's the death part, right? We're able to allow our old selves, you've heard this phrase before, you have to allow your old self to die with Christ. To let go of what has been is what actually that means. Right? Both individually and also as a community, we make the decision that when we're going to let go and become people filled with the Spirit of Christ, that means we let go of anything that is preventing us from being who we might be. But letting go is a hard concept, right? It is for me. I'm a control freak, and I don't like the thought of letting anything go. I've never been able to do that trust test where you just fall back into somebody's arm. I cannot do that with anyone. No one on earth I would do that. I just can't. I'm not going to do that way. It's really hard. Some of us it's harder for than others. Some of you have retired. Think of retirement. No matter how much you anticipate that moment when you don't have to go to work every day, it's frightening to consider if you can't quite yet imagine what that looks like. You know, I'm not quite there imagining what that might look like for me. David Letterman finished up a 33-year TV talk show host career this week on Wednesday night, retired. He announced this about a year ago, so he and everyone else has had time to kind of plan and consider what life looks like without Letterman on after the late local news. And he's had a lot of time to consider what that looks like for him. But as the days were drawing to a close, we noticed him on his show saying things like, I don't have any idea what I'm going to do. Or, what was I thinking? Or, I know this sounds crazy. 
But he also understood the value of letting go. He said in a New York Times interview recently when he was asked what Thursday, May 21st would look like. What will you do? He was asked. He said, I'll do whatever my family wants me to do. This is the first summer since my son has been alive that will not be dictated by my work schedule. So he sees the letting go not as an opportunity for loss, but as a chance to grow into this whole new way of being. That's letting go. The second way we live into the spirit is to consider what follows the death. The death is followed by the burial. We have to just be still, right? That's what a burial is, to let it be. This also is hard because it requires so much faith and so little activity in the physical sense. And most of us like to have projects going on. This doesn't require projects. It requires surrendering to silence and stillness and powerlessness and emptiness and rest. You might call it the tomb time in this process. When life isn't routine, when life is still and the rush and the din of the world is far in the distance, we hear things that we don't hear in other circumstances. Now, some of the voices in your head might be kind of scary or crazy, some of mine aren't. We might not want to hear what is ruminating in our hearts and souls. But finding a quiet center to just simply be is the key to finding the spirit, or so we read. That's the key to finding our inner wisdom. That's the key, Jesus says, to finding this spirit, this Christ within. In this quiet stillness of space and time, you have more room to be. Room to build a place for the next part of our journey, which is becoming people of the resurrection. People who are able to let go and let be so that we have space for what might be coming. So step three is to let come. Who knows what the Spirit will want us to do? No one knows. But if we say aloud, let it be. Let the Spirit come to me. We might just be amazed at what happens next. Now again, this is not easy stuff for us control freaks or people who like to maintain their own road map. I mean, I read the last two pages of the book before I started, so I'll know where I'm headed. So I got all kinds of issues about this stuff. But I do think that the growth of Christians and the growth of the church is only happening when we can get to that space of letting go and letting be and allowing something to come. So once you stop the treadmill and get off of it and sit cross-legged on the floor for a while and just breathe, your world has a different vessel to fill. Part of the beauty of yoga is the intentional focus on getting to that empty vessel space. Then the letting come is easier. It has a place to be. It doesn't have that so much on the treadmill. <clears throat> As I mentioned before, my favorite part of this Pentecost story is the inclusiveness piece. The spirit is inclusive. The spirit arrives in this room that is behind closed locked doors, but it isn't a spirit that comes to a particular race, class, or gender. The spirit isn't elite. Spirit hits everybody in that room and in that place. The spirit comes to all and it happens all at once. Everyone gathered there shares the spirit and yet understands it individually in their own different way. Pentecost then is unity and diversity, both together in harmony. Among the people who had to let Jesus go, these people had to release Jesus from their lives. They had to let that fact be that he wasn't among them anymore. And they had to gather together, be in community in a place where the Spirit was able to enter their lives and create new direction for them. And this inclusive nature 
of this very moment in our church tells us that it is a corporate function for all the earth to share. So somewhere in this struggle to let go and let be and let come, we realize that this is all about letting God guide our lives. And it's not our struggle to bear alone. They were gathered in a room together. It is a journey that God shares with us. And a journey that we all share together. All of us, all over the globe, share together. Of course, the day-to-day -day practice of letting Christ live in our hearts is much more difficult. We may even have trouble defining what that even means, letting Christ live in my heart. What does that even mean? The daily practice of letting go and letting be and letting come, often that's just too much of a personal loss of self-control. So we decide to just keep forging on the way we always have. With an awareness of the Spirit, understanding that the Spirit is something that's in our lives, but being sure that she stays at arm's reach away from us, not too close. You don't want to get too involved with the Spirit. In Don Miguel Ruiz's book, The Mastery of Love, he shares this beautiful metaphor about what giving love away actually looks like. He says, if you think you can give love to another person, you're wrong. Because it will, in this metaphor, shatter as soon as you put it in their hands. But if you realize that the love within is what you actually have to give to the other, not a handing over of an act, an actual piece of love, but an appreciation between two people that the love you both have within is what you actually share. And that can't be given away. It can only be shared and appreciated and grow. Christ is like that in our lives, right? This post-resurrection way we become Christian people who created the Christian church all those many years ago was by offering our full selves to the task of becoming what has been described throughout the centuries as the beloved community. Not by offering Christ, handing Christ over in a specific way, but sharing the love we each have for our church, for our God, for our faith, and sharing that with those who come alongside of us, whatever their path may be. That is letting go of our own priorities, letting our faith just be what it is, and letting whatever that journey ahead becomes be realized. For David Letterman, tomorrow is whatever my family wants me to do. For the people in that room on that Pentecost day that experienced the rush of that wind and the flames of fire in many languages, tomorrow is an awareness that from this moment forward, God is in every person in a way that every person can relate to and every person can understand. For us, it's a moment to stop, to be still, to think carefully, to breathe deeply, and to know that we are called to let go and let be and let the Spirit come to us. To allow the Spirit to move within us, to allow Christ to be part of us so that we may be truly able to let go of all that baggage that holds us back from being who we were meant to be. To let that spirit within us be what it is and to live life fully and abundantly. To be people who are not afraid of an unknown tomorrow, but people who look forward with great anticipation to the way we will live into the great next adventure. Amen.